Breakthrough ideas can launch an organization to unprecedented heights, but they can also become barriers to its growth. Spin Launch is facing exactly that situation. The company's innovative centrifugal launch system, once hailed as a revolutionary approach to space launches, has struggled with persistent issues for years. In the end, they had no choice but to scrap the entire orbital accelerator project and pivot back to traditional rockets. So, how did this story unfold? Let's dive in and find out. In today's episode of Alpha Tech, while most aerospace companies rely on burning massive amounts of propellant to launch rockets, a method rooted in decades of tradition, one company dared to rethink the fundamentals. Spin Launch chose electricity, angular momentum, and a giant centrifuge over fiery combustion, offering a revolutionary approach to space access. In an industry racing for faster, cheaper, and cleaner solutions, Spin Launch stands out not just for its bold innovation, but for its potential to reshape how we reach orbit. Traditional rocket propulsion releases significant carbon emissions and chemical residues, fueling greenhouse effects that contribute to global warming. That's why sustainable alternatives aren't just beneficial, they're crucial. And in this context, initiatives like Spin Launch have never been more relevant. Spin Launch is the first company to develop a technology for launching payloads into orbit while using only a small amount of fuel. It may sound unbelievable, but this green concept has been the driving force behind the company's efforts since its founding in 2014 by founder Jonathan Yaney in Sunnyvale, California. Well, basically, Spin Launch has built a massive device called the Suborbital Accelerator, standing about 164 feet tall with a diameter of 108 feet. It works by using centrifugal force inside a vacuum chamber to spin and launch a payload at incredibly high speeds. The payload is placed inside a D-shaped capsule attached to a long carbon fiber cable and spun like a slingshot. Because the chamber is a vacuum, it eliminates air resistance, allowing the capsule to reach speeds of up to 5,000 miles per hour, fast enough for suborbital flights, but still far from the 17,400 miles per hour needed to reach full orbit. So. What's the catch? Just like the name suggests, the suborbital accelerator is only a scaled-down prototype meant to test the fundamentals of this launch method. The full-scale version that Spin Launch plans to build, called the Orbital Accelerator, is the one that's supposed to have the power to actually reach orbit. But we'll get to that in a bit. All right, let me break down exactly how this thing works. The entire machine is powered by an electric motor. Inside the vacuum chamber, the D-shaped capsule is gradually spun up over the course of about 30 minutes, increasing its speed. Once it reaches the target velocity, the capsule is released and shoots upward through a vertical launch tube at a speed of 5,000 miles per hour. At the end of the tube, the capsule punches through a sealed vacuum membrane, which ensures the vacuum inside the chamber is maintained before being launched into the atmosphere. The vacuum inside the chamber eliminates air resistance allowing it to reach that incredible speed. Then, after reaching a certain altitude, a small rocket stage hidden inside the capsule separates from the payload. Finally, it ignites its engine, giving the payload that final boost needed to reach orbit. In short, Spin Launch is basically replacing the rocket's first stage. Instead of burning through a mountain of fuel just to lift off, it uses electricity to spin and hurl the payload upward. That means less fuel, lower launch costs, and way less pollution. And then, this wild idea caught NASA's attention. In April 2022, they signed a Space Act agreement with Spin Launch, basically a partnership to explore this kinetic launch system as an alternative to traditional rockets. A few months later, in September 2022, NASA joined Spin Launch for Flight Test 10. During that test, they launched a special data gathering device called the DAQ, or Data Acquisition Unit. The goal, to better understand the extreme environment inside a spin launch flight, from the insane acceleration of up to 10,000 Gs, to temperature spikes, intense vibrations, and everything a satellite might go through during launch. Flight Test 10 went smoothly with NASA confirming the device held up and the data collected was incredibly valuable. It followed a series of successful trials, with all nine previous tests between 2021 and 2022 using Spin Launch's suborbital accelerator system going off without a hitch. It marked an exciting first step toward potentially using Spin Launch for real missions down the line. 
The company also announced plans to conduct around 30 suborbital test flights over an eight-month period, starting in April 2022 at their Spaceport America site in New Mexico. However, it's been nearly three years since Flight Test 10, and there hasn't been any public update on that plan. Spin Launch's long silence has raised some eyebrows. No one really knows if the company ran out of funding, hit technical roadblocks while trying to scale up to a larger accelerator, or something else entirely. What's more concerning is that in May 2024, founder and CEO Jonathan Yaney was quietly replaced without any official explanation. The company is now led by David Wren, who previously served as COO. Just as we predicted, the company's latest move confirms they have abandoned the Orbital Accelerator project to pursue a much bigger plan this year. In early April, the company unveiled a bold new set of plans and groundbreaking projects, signaling their return to the race. And this time, they mean business. Their first ambitious goal is to create the Meridian Space Constellation. To achieve this, the startup is planning a test launch as early as next year, with 2026 mentioned for the demonstration, aiming to deploy at least 250 satellites in a single shot. If successful, this mission would break the current record held by SpaceX's Transporter 1, which launched 143 satellites. The project has already secured major backing, including $12 million from Kongsberg Defense and Aerospace, a Norwegian defense contractor. Shedding more light on the plan, CEO David Wren explained in a reply to a space journalist on X. The orbital launch system and initial deployment of the Constellation are parallel tracks to ensure the commissioning of each have independent critical paths and risk profiles. Launching initially on traditional rockets accelerates deployment, proving value and performance early while building toward the long-term vision. As for the satellites themselves, they're being designed and built by Nanoavionics, a subsidiary of KDA. Spin Launch has already signed a $135 million contract with them to be the primary supplier for the Constellation. Each satellite will be a flat, disc-shaped unit about 2.2 meters across, stacked inside the rocket like a big pile of pancakes. And they're light too, just around 70 kilograms each, which is tiny compared to the roughly 800 kilogram Starlink V2 satellites. Spin Launch has announced that the initial phase of their Meridian space project will rely on traditional rockets to launch these satellites. Because their signature kinetic launch system just isn't up to the task. They haven't specified exactly what kind of rocket they'll use, but it's likely the mission will only need one or two medium to heavy lift launchers. If this project actually pulls through, it's going to be a huge deal. I mean, we're talking about Spin Launch, a relatively young startup, still pretty new to the game, possibly smashing SpaceX's satellite launch record. That's not just impressive. That's them stepping up to compete head-on with the biggest private space company in the world. Another piece of news is that Spin Launch has been working on a larger orbital accelerator, roughly 100 meters wide, but so far everything about it remains pretty vague. They've got their eye on Adak Island in Alaska for the launch site, and in October 2023, they signed an agreement to set up a facility there. The city of Adak even showed support for the plan in April 2024. But we haven't heard any updates on the construction since then. While David Wren hasn't confirmed exactly where things stand with the Adak project by the end of 2024, he did mention that the company is hitting its investment and revenue goals. But based on the lack of updates, it seems the project might have been quietly scrapped. On paper, the specs of Spin Launch's orbital accelerator sound pretty wild. The company claims it can fling objects out of its centrifuge at speeds between 18,000 and 20,000 miles per hour as the capsule exits the system. If it really can hit those speeds, then sure, that's enough to get a payload into orbit. But even with numbers like that, the tech still has its downsides. The first big challenge is the extreme G-force the payload has to endure. We're talking over 10,000 Gs. That much force could easily crush a real satellite. To help picture it, a one kilogram object would feel like 10 tons under that pressure. So far, Spin Launch has only tested dummy payloads and hasn't pushed the system to full power. But if they do try a real satellite at max force, odds are it might not survive. To address this, Spin Launch teamed up with Portland State University to test a modified ORSAT CubeSat built to handle that brutal force. The standard version? 
its batteries were crushed. That test highlights one major limitation of this system. Payloads need complex and costly modifications just to survive the launch conditions. The second problem? Well, SpinLaunch can't exactly offer satellite launch services to other companies just yet. Sure, satellites are built tough to survive the harsh conditions of space, but with the insane G-forces from SpinLaunch, they're more likely to come out the other end as space debris than a functioning satellite. If SpinLaunch cannot solve this issue, it will not even come close to achieving one-tenth of Falcon 9's satellite launching performance, let alone Starship. Those rockets can launch large batches of satellites into orbit with extremely low risk and all for just a slightly higher cost. According to CEO David Wren, the amount of power needed for a single launch ranges from 70 to 150 megawatts. In terms of electricity costs in the U.S., that would translate to around $5,600 to $15,000, not including taxes, transmission fees, or any additional costs. However, when you factor in related expenses and the cost per kilogram to launch, the total could reach up to $500,000. Compare that to the $67 million price tag of a Falcon 9 launch, it's a tiny fraction of the cost. But when you bring Starship into the picture, things change. Elon Musk's goal is to bring Starship's launch cost down to two to $3 million, still more than spin launch, but Starship can carry 100 to 200 tons to orbit. That's a huge difference compared to spin launch, which can only handle about 200 kilograms. So, when it comes to satellite launches, Starship's potential is on a whole different level. The final drawback is that building the orbital accelerator requires a coastal location with low population density and environmental suitability. Previous plans in Hawaii and Alaska were scrapped due to local community opposition. The 2023 to 2025 plan for ADOC Alaska still hasn't seen clear progress, which has slowed down the deployment timeline. If Spin Launch can overcome these hurdles, it could offer a game-changing, cost-effective, and environmentally friendly solution for launching satellites. A faster, more sustainable method with huge potential? This technology could reshape the future of satellite launches. We'll have to wait and see if the project's really been scrapped. That's all for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching, and see you next time.